This bond is um, So I remember that. So I mean, number two is generally going to change the order a little bit um, and jump our non public session up to the front. Uh, so that's important because it's like I want to make sure it's taken care of. And then we're going to come back to the rest of it. So let's get to public comment. And then we'll go public. And then we can move on to the rest of the meeting. Um, is there anything else? Uh, just there are, you can put two after number 13. All right, uh, then we move to the six minutes. Ready? So that's I would like to make a motion that the minutes of April 6 be amended to reflect on page 8. Um, sorry, there's two parts to that I have. It's the same as our previous meeting. On page 8, it states that a motion to review and approve on a case by case basis the limited use of school facilities for the Pembroke School Community and the town of Pembroke for student use through the end of the school year was made by Mrs. Spilani, seconded by Mrs. Mandela. My motion uh, with the limitation for student use, that limitation was for um, the school district, not for the town. So I would like to have that revised to appropriately reply to my motion. Um, the other amendment that I have is on page 14, and it's the first bolded section in the votes on that flip-flopped. Um, that motion was to um, allow the town of Pembroke to use PA for town purposes. Um, and on the roll call vote, what's recorded is Mrs. Mandela, yes, Mrs. Vaughn, no, Mrs. Vaughn, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, where did I come from? Uh, Mrs. Mandela, yes, Mrs. Vaughn, no, Mrs. Vaughn, no, Mr. Gals, yes. Um, Mr. Kamich, yes, we in favor to a position of carry, carry. That was actually flip flop. Um, Ms. Mandela was no, Ms. Vaughn was yes, Ms. Vaughn was yes, Mr. Gals was no, Mr. Kamich was no. That was two in favor of the opposition, and the motion actually. This is saying I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Second. Second. Okay, second. All right. Um, motion to approve the six minutes as amended. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Opposed? So, page four is our first public comment section. With us tonight, and then we can do this time. Okay. All right. Um, so quickly before we move to the next agenda item, I'll show you the one this is the one that yes, so sorry, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to nominate the certified staff um, for positions for next year. Second. All right. Next question. 
the original building was more than 100 years old. It, the entries weren't on grade. The additions that were put onto it over the years didn't line up to any of the floors on the original building. It just would always be a problem and a big expense to maintain and keep up to standards. So with that in mind, the recommendation was to close with merge with Hill. That recommendation came with a couple of caveats. There wouldn't be enough room in Hill in its current form to take all of those programs. A two-room modular was put in. I think it was now two years out of five years on that lease. And uh, it was made clear that we need to look at and figure out what was going on. Well, what would what would need to be done there after. But it made sense to kind of wait till the merger was done and see what reality was on the ground there. We did not have as much exposure to reality because we had one year in and then really this year uh, kind of put the last list next to it with the COVID pandemic. But it gave us enough to kind of see what was going on. We saw many times just over the year that not this current school year, last school year, the first year that the two buildings were merged. It seemed like every time we went in, things had been moved because something wasn't working where it was, and there's not a lot of flexibility at all to do this domino effect where to correct one problem, you have to move this place and relocate a whole bunch of people. And then you see where it goes and you move people again. So, the village disposition subcommittee that kind of overlapping after the merger of the village was sold. I talked to you a little bit about the CMA working on page 89. We have a couple of reports that are just very, very fruitful for you to look at um, independently of this. A lot of the information that we are referencing and talking about is already known. Uh, so we did just kind of summarize and, and digest some of that for you in this report as well. Um, sure. Uh, for those of us that want to look at these, where is the easiest place for us to go and grab those reports? So I don't know where the SMU has them. I know they're available. I fully intend on transferring ownership of our Google Drive that has copies of all that in it to the SAU, which you know, they, they could get them to that way also. And do you think I sent it out to you guys when you first came on the board? Though, but that's going back a long time. It wasn't really burning to you then, but you may also have it that way. I think so. Kathy had a tab in the drive at one point, and I don't think it's outside. Um, I think it's but I will check with her and just make sure you get the link. It's the easiest. And is there also yeah. some reason you can't just put it on the public website? It, it was. Yep, it was. I just I don't know exactly where it is, but I can make sure that that needs to be fresh. Okay. Thank you. And some of these reports are this 25, 6, 7 years old too, so I just kind of maybe yeah. some relevance and fall off of the website at some point as information. Yeah, exactly. Um, but as far as the CMA engineering study, that's a report that looked at all of the school district buildings and gave you everything. It's very, very important that meets standards, is deficient, uh, recommends capital improvement categories, all kinds of stuff. And it references often I a separate clean law report, which was part of the energy management projects uh, here in the district. But there's also a separate clean law report that you can look at. It's also an RMB which I want to transfer it over. But the important stuff is referenced in the CMA report. So I don't think you really need to dig through honey law too much unless you uh, need some good advice on reading material. But for CMA at the bottom there, there's some bullet points. Really the key things about that. Hill School HVAC systems are outdated. That became kind of the forefront during the COVID pandemic. We saw the importance of, of, of addressing those systems. Um, the HVAC systems are in the newest part of the building original for the most part, or four years old. We have some reconstruction of, of parts and things like that as needed. Um, the older parts of the building simply have radiators, and it looks like old exhaust systems and things like that, but I don't even know if they're working at this point. It definitely seems like there is to make up air being brought in. You know, their, their exhaust is just kind of creating negative pressure where, where new air is coming in through. 
through the uh, building envelope being compromised, whether it's open window or things not being sealed tightly. Um, plumbing fixtures, you know, uh, they are just old, dated, broken, uh, improvised repairs as needed. Kind of, you know, if you can only do so much with a modern faucet on a seven-year-old sink. Um, no fires from the road anywhere in that building. I believe. I didn't know if the kitchen had something, but where it's definitely saying oh, the, the kitchen, yes, is yeah. above it. Yeah. Um, and the electrical system is original, so in some parts of that building, it's 60 years old. And it just does not need to make standards. Many of those classrooms have uh, on one side, but they don't have their answer. So you plug in a computer monitor and an air purifier. Uh, you better include the exhaust of those, those four plugs that you have in the room. Yeah, I think a question on these items. Sure. Um, Thank you to Mr. Pastor's team for preparing this for us. Um, if we know of all these issues are currently existing, um, do we have confirmation that all these items are currently on the CRP plan? So we'll talk a little bit about it, but for the most part, the facilities department has left these items off of the CIP plan. Um, I've heard it discussed at this board many times in its previous makeup, but that's been a deliberate decision to leave it off of the CIP plan because we know we'd be looking at a large scale project at that school at some point, and it made more financial sense to include that in in the process of, of addressing the large scale project rather than piecemeal, create a comprehensive HVAC plan, create a comprehensive electric plan, do it, don't kind of add what's here, add what's there, and then you know, double size your ability if that's what you're doing and try and start from scratch on that one. So they've kind of deliberately left that to the side and gotten by with the hopes of addressing it all at once instead of individually. John, please jump in and correct me if I, if I misstate that. that. That is correct on a lot of these items. Um, there are a few things that we focused on, like fire alarm was was grossly outdated and underserving the building. I think we're three years or so from that now. Josh was able to get that uh, to a modern addressable fire alarm system that could be expanded with the buildings expanded. And so there are some critical life safety things that obviously you can do with whether you can expand the building or not, but electrical and things like that, you get by. So we can address it all at once. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Um, Dennis Myers is the architectural firm that the school board used to kind of create a handful of recommendations initially. They presented a few years ago now, we're at three years uh, since they presented to you guys, I think it was the spring of 2018. But they created a whole bunch of scenarios, being if you fix fill it and add it, if you um, also fix fill and add it, you know, basically small scale additions to each of those buildings, or they propose a large scale renovation to fill if you close village. We didn't just want to accept that that's true, so we, we did still kind of look at the law of the small scale addition to Hill School when we were looking at this. Um, but we're going to detail kind of what they went through because we, we mostly concur with their findings. So turning over to page 10, uh, I give you a bit of an overview of the existing Hill School site. So you really have three phases of construction for that plan. Down at the bottom, you can kind of see it, although the colors printed a little off. But you have these six classrooms in orange that were built in 62. Six more, what is now six more classrooms that were built in 69, but those were at one point open concept. Um, and then basically the rest of the building was constructed in 84. And that's where the building we have now, the, the newest part of that building is, is essentially 40 years old. Uh, it, it served us well, it's been maintained well, but it's tired and there are things that have been deferred and that we need to be clearly addressed. So, page 11, you're going to kind of see we start at the top, really, with the, literally the top of the building as we look 
work that I've done the previous phase. Um, we spoke with Josh from the BBC's reports. We spoke with Susie Griffith, then principal. We brought Wendy in when, when she came on board. Um, Tammy Lacasse, the assistant principal, talked with us. We attended a staff meeting, talked to all of the staff, and uh, kind of took all of this information to what we have here. And starting at the top, we're looking at the gymnasium. It, it's a multi purpose room. It, it facilitates all of the gym classes each day, all of the lunch periods each day. If there's a school wide assembly, that's going to squeeze into it somewhere. It, 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 it really is a multi purpose room. It, it, it does a lot of jobs. It's undersized for a gym by today's standards. Really, you have a basketball court that's going to need to go to the floor, but there's really no room outside of the court to hit a wall. Um, there's no stage. The, the rate of capacity is much smaller than the school population, so you really can't even hold an assembly in with the whole school um, legally. Uh, I can imagine they're probably still trying to do quick meetings here and there when we're not in a COVID world, but if you're looking at the numbers on the certificate at the door, we shouldn't be. Um, the needs of this room really takes with the whole the whole day in, in that building to get all of the gym classes in, to get all of the lunch periods in. Every every schedule it, it, it's working around how to do that. It also means that the facilities crew has very little time to turn the lunch room over to recover from lunches back to afternoon gym classes. Uh, you know, kids in some instances can come into the room on the floor so the lack is there. There isn't 15 minutes to let the floor dry. It just doesn't exist in the day to get everything in there. Uh, so, so that can be dangerous, and, and it really needs to, to change. Um, but we'll talk about that after I kind of go through the, the deficiencies. We'll get into the, the recommendations. Uh, moving on to page 12, the, the classrooms and instructional areas. Um, we have a lot of windowless spaces in that building that are a result of additions over the years. Every time an addition intersected an existing building, it created kind of these pockets of rooms that have no natural light. In many cases, no second door in the room, so there's only one way in, one way out. Those rooms have been sliced and diced over the years to address space needs. Some of them, as a result, have no ventilation, no heat. The psychologist's office is at the what was a little bit larger room, but the psychologist landed on the half that the radiator is on. So they have no heat, which is probably okay because they're off of a hallway on an exterior spot. It's probably not terrible, but that knows you know for sure. Um, and there's an immediate need for additional classrooms. We know that there's a trailer sitting outside to house two of them. We had to eliminate a preschool program because there wasn't room since the merger. So that's, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. Um, in the 1962 wing of the building, which is going back to the previous uh, page, is the arm section, the original section, there's a lot that could be done to those rooms to make them function better. Every wall has something on it that is an obstacle for furniture placement. The side walls have these large oak ledges that stick out like four or five inches from old chalkboards that, for the most part, have been converted to bulletin boards and stuff like that, or white boards. But the ledges still exist. You can't really put anything up against them. There's a lot of piping going up and down on these walls. The window wall has a radiator from one end to the other, so you really shouldn't put a lot of furniture against that because it inhibits airflow. And then the wall that the doors are on all have sinks on them. Which again, you have the same cabinet, the exposed piping, uh, all these just obstacles that give you very little option for, for putting furniture against walls and out of the way. You'll see that the radiators are blocked right now because they're going to be they just had to push everything against it. But to really set up a classroom, they can't. And then say nothing for the fact that those rooms don't, don't meet today's standards for a classroom. Um, chapter 321 of the Ed Regulations talks about building construction. 
and they define a kindergarten class, which should be a thousand square feet. Or if you uh, if you are more than a thousand square feet, there's a, a square footage per child, but it's it, it's at least a thousand square feet that you have to have. And this is where our kindergarten classrooms are right now. And those numbers range from 794 to 815 square feet. So some of our smallest rooms in the building are housing the classes that should have the most space by by, by law. Um, and then we move over to the 1969 edition, which is the six other classrooms that were originally the open concept. But we've added walls because we were in the 70s that open concept doesn't work. These walls, though, people like to refer to them as the $10,000 walls. Um, but they don't, they don't block sound. They don't, if a kid hits against the wall on one side, things can fall on the other. They're not much better than the old accordion walls that were there before them. There needs to be a better option implemented there at some point because they don't, they don't, serve their purpose much better than anything that's collapsible. Um, and that's what was there before that. But these are also small classrooms there. Uh, the, the square footage is slightly larger than the, the old way, but not by much. And there are many cases in the same. But we can we can talk about if you look at the large schematic that says existing floor plan in the bottom right, that shows you the square footage of each room. So you're looking at, um, sorry, I'll move my glasses. You're looking at about 770 to 800 square feet for each room by plus or minus. Again, below the 1,000 square foot for kindergarten, or it's 900 square feet for grade, grades one through four. Elementary classrooms generally is 900 square feet. But again, we're, we're, we're well below that in many of those cases. So those are classrooms. They don't meet today's standards. And then you have the 84 wing that, you know, is the rest of the building. And those classrooms are size 12 for, for today's education standards. You're, you're in the 900 plus square feet for each of those. Uh, that being said, 1984 was before the Americans with Disabilities Act. There are still problems with that section of the building that we need to, need to address. And we'll talk about that as we continue on page 14, which we talk about operational and support areas. That's the kitchen, uh, IT, workroom, support room. Those are all support areas, not, not, um, not instructional areas like the classrooms. But the kitchen has, in many cases, original surfaces. That's, you know, laminate and stuff like that from the 80s, which is not appropriate for food prep or, or anything like that. It should be a stainless steel surface. Um, the ventilation in there is, I don't know if there is any, but it, it's very hot in there all the time. If you were in there in the middle of winter, so I don't know why I know, but this time of year or in the more, even warmer times, you get what that one gets like. Um, but we have standalone refrigerators, freezers that are coming contributing to that problem. There's really no desk space for a food service coordinator that's on, that might be on the ground in there. Um, there's no storage, it's not ample for, for what it is now. Um, well, they don't cook and you know, make the meals there, it's still not even appropriate for the serving operation that they do. It needs to be updated in proper, proper um, food storage areas, whether that's climate controlled or dry storage. And we'll talk about that again in the recommendations. Um, there, there's a book room going below the kitchen. The book room that we're talking about is a professional book room. It is a room that was previously in the classroom. The classroom was shelved out. And that room holds baskets of collections of books that the staff used as part of the literacy program in their room. So they, it's, a, it's a library for the staff. They check out collections of books that they then use with their students in their rooms. They bring them back and get the next set that they need for their next lesson and in the progression of their literacy program. That doesn't exist now. It's a book room independently because we don't have the room for it. 
it's been merged into the library right now. So what was the library storage room is now part of the book room. And then maybe a third of the library floor cat has been taken over for the rest of this collection. And the last I heard that collection was not even completely built out yet. We were told it was around 50% built out and that it was still growing. So right now anything in any enlargement to that it takes away from the library for the students um, and the shelf space for, for student book collections. We talk and we look at work rooms there, those are deficient, they don't really exist. There's one that we created. Josh took over the art storage room and created a work room there. When we're talking about work rooms, these are rooms that have copiers. Um, I think one of them has faculty mailboxes in it some frequently used supplies and paper and stuff like that that's accessible quickly and easily. Um, the other one is in the library because there wasn't any place for it. It started out the copiers and stuff where I need to run across the hall from the library, but the noise and the distraction of the people going in and out wasn't feasible for the classroom operation. So that moved to the library. That's also a distraction to the library that when staff members are going in and out for copies, copy machines randomly firing up during classes to print things off. It, it, it's a necessary evil right now, but it's, it's an evil for the library program as well now. We don't have any evidence to put it down. And in all honesty, it's kind of in the middle of the building and it's not that far from the first quarter room that we have. And it was should be kind of more in the mix of the rooms that it's servicing instead of having to chase across the building to get to those things. Um, information technology wasn't even a thing when this building was built. The newest part of the building, we weren't thinking about computers in every classroom, wired networks, let alone wireless. So it just, the infrastructure isn't really there. There's, there's access points and stuff that have been added, but the equipment closet has been improvised into what, what, what is the electrical room? And it seems like that's working okay. But IT was frequently kind of stashing their graveyard items, for lack of a better term, in there too, which just kind of created a problem. They're doing better about that, from what I understand. It didn't seem as bad the last time I was in there, but there's just no other place to put some of those things that are taken out of service while they're waiting to be fixed or waiting to be put in service, they kind of were getting thrown on the floor in there, and it was getting pretty rough. You want to be able to get to your electrical panels and things, um, your shutoffs when you, when you need to. So having an obstacle course on the floor is not ideal. And then storage, there isn't any storage now. Any liquor candy that was previously used to store things has been used now for educational or instructional space. Um, the facilities department has one small janitor's closet across from the nurse's office, give or take. And then there's a small storage room around the corner in the three floor range, but that is, that's really it for, for storage in the building. I mean, we have the pod that was recently brought in, but I don't, I don't think the plan is to keep that any longer than we have to. Um, and then moving over to page 15, we're talking about the teacher's room. It's a small windowless room. It does not see any people, and it's got two little toilet closets right off of it. Um, and when I say closet, they are closets. So there's one of them you can't even close the door without like sideways between the wall and the toilet to close the door. Like it, they really don't even have room for the fixtures in there, let alone a person trying to use them. And it's just kind of gross that they're enough of a heating area. Um, and they're definitely not an EDA component. The other room is actually one of the rooms in the building that's pretty nice for its intended space. Um, our only suggestion was kind of to make sure we look at long term storage because I don't think the storage closet will ever be reclaimed for the art room. The architect proposes using it for a different purpose. We're already using it for a different purpose. But I'll be honest, I cleaned that room last week and uh, even it looks like there's even some more improvised storage solutions in there from a furniture standpoint since I was in there last. It looked pretty well organized. 
But the bridge is a great size for our program. She's able to have a common area work tables, supply closets, free standing supply closets, shelf materials. It actually is one of the few rooms that, that is pretty nice in its own current form. But we just want to make sure that the storage needs are being met where that closet isn't there, but it does look like they are. The library, though, um, like I said, we've got a third or so of it that's been taken for the literacy collaborative materials. The storage room has been taken for the literacy collaborative materials. Um, the room got half tiled at one point, but the other half carpet is still there, which kind of gives you this weird transition in, in the right in the middle of the room. And it doesn't line up with you know, like furniture ends or, or table placement. It's just kind of strange. Um, so there are just a few things that we, we're going to need to look at in there. And then we move over to office, you know, the administrative areas. It's the main office, conference spaces, meeting spaces, um, the administrative team office areas, nurse, all of that fun stuff. Um, the main office seems to work pretty well for the two people that are in there. Um, but in talking to them, they had some concerns about the security in the lobby. Right now, the security door has been installed kind of near after the entry to the office. Uh, you don't get buzzed in or anything before that. You actually go in the first set of doors, you go through a door which was a second set of doors, but the doors have been removed. There's a door to the principal's office on the right, there's a door to the main office on the right, then you encounter the locked doors to the corridor. Um, there was a little concern that the lock door should be before any, any doors that, that could be potentially breached by somebody with ill intent. Um, and, and we do kind of concur with that, as we'll see when we get to the recommendation. Part. The nurse's office is very small. The bathroom is like the teachers in the bathroom is slightly larger. It's not ADA compliant. It, it, it was built in a different time. And it uh, will need to be looked at. And then uh, going back to electrical, you know, the distribution panels and connecting wiring, and all for the most part is original. We have a few lots of rooms that have gotten, you know, get the public chatbot at some point and speak to Josh or his predecessor or something. Um, I think I know Josh enough to know it wasn't here that got sweet talk, but somewhere along the lines, you would release the bathroom or, or something, you know, something with somebody else that got the inputs that they, they so desired. Uh, but for the most part, people don't have any of the electrical access they need. And uh, as a result, there's extension cords there, there's wires going up into the ceiling and coming down. Well, I'm uh, not usually electrical wire, but if phone wires, data cables, things like that, go up and come back down. Um, you can see in the picture there's extension cords going under the well, and that's just a big number too. And, um, I don't want to give you the room number that that was in, I'll let you go find it. Um, you know, you can see on the next page just the snarl of wire and stuff from power strips. Like it, it's making the best of a bad situation, um, but it is a bad situation for them in the 21st century. Is it? Well, it's good to know, I guess. Uh, you'll see also talking about electrical light fixtures and mostly the original on that building. Unfortunate enough to be able to update them to LED tubes within the original lighting, but there's a lot of broken lenses, missing concealer plates, and it just adds to the entire exposed look of the building. Um, page 18 plumbing. We have brand new bathrooms in this part of the building, probably about five years old now, give or take. Um, those are in good shape, they meet modern standards. Um, the only suggestion people had from a staff standpoint was. The boys from urinals didn't have privacy dividers. You could see them right from the hallway, but the last time I was in there, they do now. So that the only complaint about those brand new bathrooms has been rectified. Um, but you go up into the 84 or any other building where the other bathrooms are. Those are very tight, very tired, and do not appear to meet any day standards. You can send a picture there. It doesn't not look like there's five foot two radiuses where we are um, between those, those sinks and those, those stalls. Um, and then continuing with plumbing on the next page, that are 19, you can just see some of the original plumbing fixtures in the classrooms. Uh, they're tired, they're, 
contaminants are less than him. They are somewhere one by like filler that's been placed on top of the counter that new holes drilled in it for a faucet and stuff like that. Um, it gets the job done, but it is time to create a replacement plan for those fixtures and get them out of there. And then the second oldest portion of the building at the bottom down the is it's not much better than a little bit. Then we go over to H20 where we're talking about HVAC. I mentioned the psychologist's office doesn't have feet. There's a lot of rooms without windows that just really shouldn't be used for instructional areas that may be appropriate for an office space for a person, but it doesn't doesn't seem like we should be bringing large groups of students into these rooms, even small groups of students into these rooms. That 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 is space better well used for your work rooms and you know, your your auxiliary purposes. Um, but you can see pictures there of the exhaust systems that what I believe are exhaust, at least they looked like they fed up to uh, on page 20. They looked like they fed up to uh, perhaps roof mounted fans at one point. I don't know if they were. I don't know. I don't know if they're still in service, but like I said, it doesn't appear that there's any makeup there. It's just kind of coming in through the lack of tightness in that little bit. And then the bottom picture there, you can just see that's a radiating wall that is just wall to wall furniture, which I'm hoping is just kind of a result of the COVID situation right now. Trying to do photos and desks, the appropriate space in this COVID situation. But then when you move over on page 21, we're talking about the 84 building. You've got, um, I showed you a unit panel here, you just don't know what we're talking about. I will tell you, I'm doing a job similar to Josh's in my past. When people complained about the unit ventilators at first, I was kind of thinking that they were being a little difficult until we went to a staff meeting and the unit ventilator was coming over our head while we were trying to talk in the library. They're very loud, very loud, and you don't really notice they make it three o'clock or whatever time they shut off and like shut off on us. You realize just how much noise it was contributing to in your room. Um, then below that picture, I showed you that there are a few windowless rooms that have had um, a bathroom fan, for lack of a better term, installed at some point. The one in that picture actually does not work anymore. The switch has been removed. Um, that's an office that I think at least was a quiet room at one point in its past. So a couple of months have been removed, switches have been removed from a safety standpoint, and never got put back. But in the uh, speech office across the hall from that room, there's also one of those bathroom fans, and they're very loud. It's not switched with the lights or anything. It's got its own switch in the back corner of the room, so you actually have to want to use it. It's not forced on you to turn the exhaust air from that room. So that's kind of a big overview there um, of what's wrong with the building. Um, going a little deeper than just the space needs. Um, which we'll talk about a little bit in the recommendations. But, so what we did with the um, recommendations on page 22 was we kind of took it section by section in the same order that we identified the deficiencies for you. So talking about the gym, multi-purpose room, really, um, we recommend that a new gym be built, that it be large enough to um, accommodate athletic events, the old school as an assembly, um, that it have a stage for those purposes so that it can also be used for things that right now get shoved into other buildings that have a stage. I'm talking about the Christmas concert, the spring concert, things like that. Um, it also kind of addresses a community need, which is always seems to be lack of athletic space if you have a, a appropriately sized facility at our other school building. Um, what, what happens when you construct this gym, you free up what is right now the uh, physical education teacher's office and equipment storage room that can become storage space for your kitchen area. Um, that multi-purpose room is now available to be a lunch room. It can accommodate smaller groups of students in an assembly format. So if there was a need for a break level, 
meeting where the fourth grade class is all want to meet. There's a room large enough that they could do that around the lunch schedule. They're, they're, this room can address the needs of a staff meeting without sitting on the little chairs in the library and things like that. It, it just it frees up the schedule quite a bit during the day. And it also gives the, the gym teacher kind of an alternative. So if you needed to have a whole school assembly and you needed to, from a facility standpoint, get that, the gym ready, gym class could now shift into the old gym aids where it's now the large room. You know, to improvise the class in there on a, on a nice and good basis. Below that, we talk about full size classrooms. And we actually, like I said, we, we looked at the proposals from Dennis Myers. There was a large scale and a small scale. And we didn't want to just dismiss the small scale one, which is on the last page of your blueprints. It's marked 8104 in the bottom right. That's the small scale renovation. That was proposed in conjunction with renovating and lodging village. But we did look at it to see, like, would that be adequate? And, and we were able to kind of cross that off. And, and I'll get into why, because we actually looked at the large scale one and we felt that that fell slightly short as well when it comes to classroom count. And we recommend that 16 additional full size classrooms be built in that school. Um, and the reason for that is because. 12 of the existing classrooms aren't properly sized. And if you got into the bigger project of like taking down dividing walls and rebuilding them in other places, um, you might be able to create some classrooms that are the right size, but you're going to run into obstacles with windows and things like that. But they just make it, make it seem like that's not the best option. The best option would perhaps be to take those smaller classrooms that are proper for a general education environment, but use them for some of these secondary uh, needs of the building right now. Those things that are in the windowless rooms. Um, so we're, we're at the number of 16. And if you look at the large scale edition um, from Dennis Myers, that is in the bottom right, it says proposed site plan. They actually, um, they call for a few things here that we didn't really agree with. Um, if you look at, and this is assuming you guys are somewhat familiar with the floor plan of the existing building, but if you look at the two classrooms across from the current art room, they proposed taking that wall down. We did not agree with that. It, it seems silly to, um, take away a classroom maybe. And what I think their thought process was on that was at the time that they did this, the district was looking at a elementary band program. So we've gone away from that. So I think what they were trying to do was create a large music room there that isn't necessary at this point with the direction that we've gone in. So we would recommend that we do not take that wall there and create one big room keep it two full-size classrooms. And if the district ever did go down the road of creating a band program, they could look into perhaps taking an adjacent classroom for a band room if needed or adjacent to a music room. Um, or well give you another option in there, but don't take away the classroom. But if you add on to this building, you see up by the gym there's a map loss of the classroom right below the gym basement, and that's to create a connection to a new addition from the old. So you lose a classroom there. And then their, their proposed addition has a gym, and I believe it's 12 classrooms off of it. To get to the 16 classrooms, we would propose that you keep the wall in, those, in the existing building there across from the upper room. That you add to 12, I believe it's 12 or it's not quick. It's actually 14. So you keep the wall, you add the 14, and then you find a place to do a one more classroom. So, what are some possibilities? We're not architects, we're just throwing out some possibilities here. If you look at the proposed addition, the bottom right corner, there is a spot where you could carve out one more room. Right at the bottom. 
Or if you look at the small scale emission, the A104 diagram, you'll see up to the right of the gym there's a stage, and then behind the stage there's a music room, large music room there. Maybe you still do that even though it's not on the large scale emission. That's your 15th classroom. The music room is kind of on its own at that point. From a noise standpoint, that's nice. It's a big gym and not really adjacent to instructional areas. And if you had a band program, the room is probably sized for it. But that gets into your 16 there. What does 16 classrooms do for you? That brings you to a net of, I think that brings you to 40 or 41 classrooms for a building. Right now, there are 25. But again, keep in mind, nearly half of those are not appropriate in size. 12 out of 25. And that's not counting the hour because that's not a typical classroom. I can left that up in my classroom counts on, on both sides. But if you add on these classrooms, you give yourself a bit of flexibility in the future too. Our population grows and we need to go back up to five grades per grade level. You have those rooms. If there's a bubble here and you need to add a room to a grade level as it kind of goes up through, you have the room. You have a room to bring back the title preschool if the funding still exists. The feds are talking about universal preschool right now. If that becomes a reality, if you have a couple extra classrooms, you can couple that with the room you just paid for the restoring title preschool, the room. The two rooms that we designate for um, TLC preschool, which is the special education preschool program. If you needed to add one more room, you kind of have four preschool classrooms you have that I would assume preacher would be probably a morning and afternoon like to each student, not a full day. That's a lot for a small child. Um, or if you had a bubble grade and you got up to three rivers, and all of a sudden they don't have room. Add three rivers. Fifth grade could push it down to this school if it needed to. It just it gives you a lot of flexibility. I'm not endorsing any of those. I'm not saying they're ideal, it, but it gives you flexibility as if you just have a large age group cycling through the district. You, you, you could you could pull fifth grade down if you needed to to give TRS a little breathing room if as the, the bubble grade goes through their building. So 16 classrooms. Um, You'll see at the bottom of that page <laughs> a real key. All classrooms older than you should be equipped with. That includes sinks. There's one classroom across from the library at the work student that we need at some point, probably when it was a computer lab. Although there was a whole joke in the wall to where it used to be, so that might be coming back already. Um, but adequate standardized electrical in the room um, and, and real HVAC to and exhaust and with noise levels in mind. So moving over to operational and support areas, um, I can talk about this and sort of moves over to the kitchen if, if you do this. Um, you also should put your refrigerators and freezers on the uh, building management system, basically along them, so that you know if they go out of temperature, they're not currently, um, as I understand it. And then obviously the HVAC improvements, which we'll talk about in the um, And I'm just not sure if the fire suppression system is tied into the fire alarm system now in there. It wasn't at one point, but that was before the fire alarm. So if it's not, it should be. But I named it already. Um, proper reconfiguration down in the second paragraph there with the kitchen. That gives you space to have a food service uh, workspace. That gives you um, from our prep areas ventilation. They they need it in there. It gets hot, so bringing in proper um, HVAC cooling would not be unreasonable in there. In all honesty, but it would definitely ventilation at the least, and some some control in there over it within reason. I know Josh can want to get too much control over that so they don't use it. Um, the both room. It needs to go back into a classroom. The book room also has the uh, literacy coordinator. That's a teacher to kind of put, correct me if I'm wrong, Marty, but they kind of push into classrooms um, as part of the literacy collaborative. But the way it was set up before 
records, the collection is kind of shown in the perimeter of the room. The literacy coordinator had a desk space in there, and then there was also um, conference space in the middle so that um, small staff meetings could happen in there, whether it's um, collaboration with the literacy coordinator. Um, you could recently make that a, a bookable space for other meetings as well, whether it's a, an IEP meeting or, or anything that we it gives you, it kind of hits a bunch of, of, of problems there. It gives you the, the book storage back, it gives you the literacy coordinator, their desk space back, and it gives you a meeting space because they're in this room, you'll have right now either. Two literacy coordinators? Okay, it's two literacy coordinators, not just one. Um, the work rooms just need to be uh, some consideration to strategically placing that. If you look at the Dennis Myers diagrams, there aren't really any considerations given to those. It looks as though they kind of took the existing things and the only way to just kind of mark them down somewhere and say, check, there's a spot for it. It didn't give a lot of consideration to the things that were missing but needed. And work rooms are a big one. They should be strategically placed so that. They're in reasonable proximity to teachers, especially at the elementary level, because there isn't much opportunity to escape your room and, and grab materials at hop if you need to during the day. So if they're depending on the teacher next door to kind of you know stand in the doorway between the rooms and keep an eye on both when you want to get something, you don't want to have to go either from one side of the building to the other. It should be, you know, they should be in the same position. Um, let me get down to IT. The IT director said that the switches that are located in the electrical room currently is adequate, but they do need space for equipment that's not currently being used, whether that is um, broken equipment that is needing to be serviced. There's always a handful of extra stuff, usually old things that a monitor that was replaced, but the old one isn't quite dead yet. You keep it on a shelf just in case something dies, and you gotta pull it out and, and pull it back into service. They need space for that stuff. They really don't have it right now. It's, it's in a room that used to be a locker room, bathroom, off of the multi purpose room. It's also got custodial supplies in there. It's also where the technology integrator is, is located. It still has the toilets in the same street, it's still, it's still a bathroom. If they wanted to. Um, but it, it needs to have an independent space for that storage. There should be space in that in there for your IT staff. There are three, I think, IT technicians in the district that kind of go between all the buildings. But when they get to high school, there's no place for them to do anything really unless they come after hours or interrupt what's going on in that room during the day. They don't have a desk space where they could work on a computer. They will get back here, from what I understand. If they need to service something or replace a screen or a keyboard or whatever it is. Um, the IT director would also like it that the weeks in March to have an on-server requirement closet in that space. That could include desk space and storage space. All these things could be included in an on-server requirement closet, which would just have your your switches, your patch panels, your wiring for the new building would run into that. Um, but there wouldn't be room in the existing electrical closet to add all of that. And you want to be within, I think it's 300 feet for an Ethernet run. Um, so you'd be able to be pushing the limitations there anyway if you want to punch that all down to the existing wiring closet in the existing building. Um, storage, they need it right now. I mean, three to four your tables. Or excuse me, desks to replace tables, and you don't want to get rid of stuff when you don't need it temporarily as the pendulum or the want of a specific teacher swings the other way. Um, you want to be able to kind of keep those assets for when you need them again, within reason, obviously. But that's where some of those windowless spaces right now would come in handy. If you're using some of the small classrooms that are undersized for classrooms, for the, the things that are taking place in those windowless spaces. That's uh, space right now is currently being used for like a special ed case manager with a small group of students. In some cases, the small rooms are taking more than one group of students. 
They used to do it in classroom settings, now being crammed into these closets, for lack of a better word. Um, the assistant principal was in one of these little rooms by four corners at one point. That's no windows. That's now student support. Again, those students that just keep happening. But the assistant principal is kind of in another little storage space next to the boiler. And yeah, it's very warm in that room because of its proximity to the boiler. Um, but using some of these spaces now that just not really appropriate for our spaces or for those storage needs makes a lot of sense. Um, so the teacher's room, give it a classroom, a full size classroom. If you ever got into a binding down the road and needed to reclaim that classroom for educational purposes, you could. But the size of the staff wanted to a full size classroom size space for, for them to eat their lunch in. Take the bathrooms out of it. There are staff bathrooms throughout the building that, that, that can be used. Uh, it just nobody wants to eat adjacent to that. Um, and that room, in keeping with the other staff rooms in the district, like it, it should have a higher control on it. It's not unreasonable to have a, a cool area to go online for 15 minutes and, and, and eat your lunch. Um, moving on to page 24, operational and support areas continuing. Like I said, the algorithm really just make sure the storage needs are being met. It looks like they are, but just be sure because that would be a furniture solution, not really a construction solution. A furniture would obviously be a part of, of the, you know, enlarging or renovating the building. Uh, the library. You get most of it back just by implementing these other recommendations. You take the book room back out of the library, um, you take the library their storage room back, so you don't have this mountain stuff under the circulation desk. Um, IT has its own storage space, so those things are not going to deposit too like they used to be. Um, it all kind of goes back to normal. The, the thing that really needs to be addressed is the flooring in there. It needs to be finished. I put in here the obvious solution is to go to BCT. Let's only look here from a, a maintenance standpoint. But carpet, it makes more sense in the library, especially with little kids that like to kind of sit down against the shelf and move through a book. It's better from an acoustical standpoint in a large room like that. Library here's carpeting. Uh, it also um, helps with the sun. That's got very good southern exposure there. And during the fall, winter, and early spring months when the sun's at a low angle. It hits right off that floor and shines right at you. So the so carpet would help with that problem too, because the, the shades in those windows are basically an all or nothing shade. It's not, not a light filter, it's, it's blocking, you know, it's like also double safety devices and you know, about lockdown and stuff. But you, 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 you achieve a lot of the, the issues. You achieve a lot of the solutions just by implementing the other solutions in there. The administrative areas. We really kind of concur with Dennis Myers on this one almost completely. So, what they propose is taking what is right now, I think it used to be the conference room. I'm not sure if it's special or coordinator there by Four Corners, just past the nurse's office. Um, they take that room, they take the, what is the work room, the old art storage room, they take all of that for the main office area and they create a main office suite there um, with a large nurse's office, ADA complaint bathroom off of the nurse's office. I believe they put a shower in there if needed. Um, they created an assistant principal and a dining space in there, excuse me. Um, but they, they, they really did put a lot of effort into creating a workable space there. They also take what used to be the locker room bathrooms off of the gym and create a conference room there off of the main lobby and an office space for a um, special ed coordinator at the building level if there is one. The reason that's nice is you can have a meeting with parents or guardians or whatever the case is in a conference room setting there without giving anybody access to the building during the day. They're just accessing the lobby. If you keep that existing locked door also, you can actually let them in conference with them during the school day and they don't have any access to the corridors that students are in. Um, that we, we agree with all of that. Electrical, 
replace the labels as suggested. Um, some of them are original. Uniform electrical, chemical, electrical. It's so important. Um, we don't talk about it in the report, but there are modular options that you can consider too, where every classroom has a wire coiled up above the ceiling grid that can plug into a power pole. If you, you know, say you have a 40 by 40 room, this is coiled up in the center of the ceiling, it's 25 feet long, you can bring it to any perimeter wall in any direction, drop a power pole through the ceiling tile, plug it in. You know, there are lots of great power options. The needs of a room change to down the road if every room is wired that way. That's obviously at a higher cost, but it gives facilities down the line a lot more flexibility. Um, and just secure the power pole down by the floor, whether it's to the wall or to the floor, and you can move away. Plumbing, just like electrical, it should be standard and uniform in classrooms. So there are any classroom space can be used in, for any class type as it needs to change and fluctuate. It shouldn't have to revolve around the fact that this room has a sink, this room doesn't, this room has enough outlets, this room doesn't. You know, creating the uniformity for the 21st century classroom. And then the HVAC, we really think that the ventilators should go. They're noisy, they're localized. So we, whether it's a rooftop option, something of the Above the ceiling grid line, but below the roof line, or something ground, you know, ground mounted outside the building, like a perimeter somewhere that feeds into a ductwork network. But creating a centralized uh, HVAC option with proper air handling, exchange, filtration, heating, dehumidification does not really exist. I included a picture at the very end of this report of sacking ceiling tiles. It's a common problem throughout that building. Um, actually, the oldest wing of the building is the one that shows really the, the least amount of sacking and stuff from the tiles. And, um, that's caused by humidity levels not being managed, but it's, there's also a, at some point a ton of fiberglass insulation just got thrown up above the grid. The grid's not rated for that. Your tiles aren't rated for that weight. So insulating is important, but getting it right is also important. When you have all that insulation up there too, it makes it very difficult to uh, do the things you need to do above the grid line, whether it's why you wire it and things like that. So that's where we are with HVAC. You may want to just consider cooling the whole building, but I think dehumidification will go a long way. But I mean, you look in the windows here, they all have ACs hanging out of them. At some point, you're going to need to deal with all those old ACs, whether it's replace them or if you, if you just include your corporate cooling into your centralized system, it's there. You manage it to what you think are the proper levels. I'm not saying you keep an iron place box, but you have the ability. Buildings are becoming more and more in your ground, too. It just if you have a in there, summers are longer and hotter. It gives you the ability, but it doesn't have very many means to dehumidify that air. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about exterior spaces. Um, if you look at the deck spires proposals, they show you the proposed tree line, the existing tree line, all of that stuff. They pretty much address everything we're saying there, but um, they don't address the playground. The playground is very large, very spread out. Very old. A lot of that equipment was there when I was a kid. Some of stuff. Some of it has just disappeared. In the last couple of years, um, the lady slide that was there when I was a kid just went away. But I would imagine that playground is a nightmare to manage from a staff standpoint with kids running around everywhere under normal circumstances, just because it's so big. Um, but uh, you, you want you need to address some of the aging equipment. But while you're doing that, you may want to. Revisit how it's set up, where it's laid out, and whether that's relocating it to a smaller playground on a very small field space or part of the existing playground. It may not make sense to keep it as large as it is. Um, again, so these are recommendations, but any, any final proposals from the architect really should incorporate the building's the building level. Um, 
in some of them just for lack of a better term. It doesn't seem like there was much of that originally. It was very conceptual based off of what was already in different places. Um, and then obviously any part of that is removed for a large building should be in place somewhere else. And if you look at this, they do propose a new parking lot above the new gym. They propose enlarging. Um, if you don't enlarge the upper staff parking lot, you do really need to look at trees up there, though. I don't want to like parking there because there's pine trees all around it and there's colors of each on the car if you park over there. So even if you left it alone, you got to deal with the trees up there. And then I'm kind of putting something at the end here that I want to talk to you guys about um, the telephone system there. And I'm going to get a little personal when I talk about this, but this came up many times when I talked with the staff that they can't get an outside line to call out when they need to, and people can't call in. And when I say I'm going to get personal, my wife worked at Hill School for five years now, and I've had to call her twice. Once when my dad had a stroke, and once when my younger brother died unexpectedly. Neither time I could get to this to the other way. I got a busy signal, I got a voicemail, I could redial, like I could not get through to the building. That's a problem. And if I can't get in, people trying to call out can't get out. I had to just constantly redial my wife on her cell phone until she saw me calls and knew that something was wrong and called me back, but I couldn't get through. And the staff complained of the same thing. They need to call parents during their prep period. They can't get enough to the line. Um, I don't know if it's true, but somebody said there's two lines to the building. So if you've got a call coming in and a call going out, that's it. You know, I don't know if that's a limitation of the number of phone lines. I don't know if that's a limitation of the phone system, but it's definitely uh, that's something, something troubling needs to be looked at. And even if you do nothing to the building, you really need to take that to heart and, and address it, maybe with your $800,000. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, that just is, is a serious problem that, that it's there. Obviously, any phone enhancements, if you get into hardware, like a phone system versus adding a line, should be given due consideration though to function within a large in a larger building if you do pull the trigger on that sooner than the rest of the renovation. Um, so page 27 is just our final thoughts and then I'll go over a couple of the next things quick. Um, so we've talked about all of our, our, our items here, but we really recommend that you bring that responders back in now with our recommendations and with the, the staff, whether it's you know, initially at a, a leadership level, whatever it is, that's for you guys to decide how you bring the building level into it. But there needs to be some consideration to the, to the people in the building you know, on how like, we didn't go so far as to say that this should go here, this should go there. But that's, that's not up to us. That's the people that really understand, you know, how the building flows and works and shit. But you do need to bring them back in. You should have at least a half thousand square foot classrooms that are before you can our new pre-K program. So they're meeting the, the state standards there. Even on the Dennis Myers drawings, number of rooms are a thousand or larger. A few look like they come close. I couldn't quite tell if it was 989 or 999. They're right there. Um, and then some consideration with the building should be given to whether or not these kindergarten classrooms, if you're going to rework them to hit the thousand threshold, should they have a bathroom in there for students? Not all kindergartners are body trained. There isn't. The staff really need to accompany them to the bathroom. Really. Having a bathroom in the classroom may not be unreasonable. That came up with a bit in conversation. We didn't have suppliers to recommend that we do it, but some consideration should be given with the architect and whether and the staff on whether or not that really is um, absolutely necessary and feasible, whether it's from a financial or you know space square square footage perspective within the footprint of the expansion. Um, I'm not going to read the rest of that. You guys can kind of read our final thoughts there, but I, I think it makes more sense. We talked a little bit at the group level about do you do it all at once? Do you kind of say we need eight classrooms right now? Deal with the six layer. The problem with that approach, we think you should do it all at once and get it done, start the bomb, just from a couple different perspectives. You need to get the base, 
get on your fixed bond schedule, you know what you're going to be looking at for costs down the road to pay it off. Your building is ready for any potential changes in the future. But the other thing is, if you go into PA, you go into three hours of going to middle school, there's definitely a disparity in the physical condition of the building from the other two in the district. And you know if you give our facilities department a building where all of the deficiencies are corrected, that they are capable of maintaining it. They've been able to do it here. So this building is, for the most part, 20 years old. When in fact, during the last final project, three or more, so it's only about eight years newer than the middle school. You never know if walking in, it looks brand new stuff. They've been able to maintain that one. It's brand new completely. If we take care of all the problems, we give the building the square footage that it needs for the future. Our facilities department can, can keep it from there. You know, you're just kind of you're, you're balancing your costs in the future. You know what it's going to be. You're not always kind of reacting to the problems as they pop up, waiting for a school district meeting to get approval to build two more classrooms. You know, and when I say that, that's the, what I call the dumb bar right? You know, you build a speed, you build a speed, you build a speed. We're in a very small town, but even if you need to, you could be in a situation where you're waiting for school district meeting. Um, so like, hey, let's be bringing in another monitor. Like you're always reacting instead of just being ready for the, 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 the changes down the road. So after that, I kind of just gave you some information on items. You've got a list of what we determined in talking with staff and stuff. Items that need full-size classrooms. And obviously, when you have to scan it on there, it should be on there, correct it. Because um, we have a lot of notes come back over a lot of months. So, uh, condensed it all, we could have incorrectly, but by my count, there, that's 36 classrooms. So, you're only at four or five flex rooms if you did a full 16 additional classrooms there. And keep in mind, 12 classrooms currently are not sized appropriately. Um, the next page, we just kind of show you some student enrollment. Um, the reason I included this is what's interesting is while enrollment's kind of declined, um, special ed's creeping up. And it seems with the limited information that's been provided to us that the severity of the special ed cases seems to be increasing too. Like they, since we started this, they've gone from one bridge classroom to two bridge classrooms at, at middle school. Um, which is basically means, if my understanding is correct, for some of the specialized programs for, for students that may otherwise need to be um, placed at the school to expand the ability to, in this space to kind of adjust those needs from, again, from what I understand. I'm not an educator and I'm not an employee of the board. And then I just gave you some larger um, images that we found throughout the um, so the board, so you get a larger version of the existing floor plan, um, the phase, you know, all of that stuff is back there. And then just a few more images, like I said, the sagging tiles are throughout. Um, but Josh, you could give Josh the money to go by and let's say we can bring the tiles. If you don't address the community, you don't address the fact that towns and towns and towns of insights have just been thrown up there, they just don't need the same thing. So, I mean, if you're going to the insulation up there, you may want to go to a 2x2 grade or something like that, but definitely placing the tiles is going to fix it, which is exactly why he has not done that. He would have done it if, if that was the solution to the problem. So, I'm sorry I went quite long on that, but it's important after all these months to give you the most detailed um, review from what we found. I have a few numbers here. Did I leave anything out? Did I misstate anything? And I guess if you have questions, I'll attempt to answer them. I mean, we'll kind of turn the units and run along, but um, otherwise, let me know if you think of something. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, super detailed. Appreciate your work. Very, very, very good information. Does anybody have immediate questions? Thank you. Um, this is Amy, and I first want to say thanks. This is really exciting. Um, you know, I don't want to say like 
I don't think I've ever post my stinks, but I like your word tired. Um, it, it is tired and it does need some help. Um, and I am all for the recommendations for the committee, and my comments are to carry things forward and to sort of start thinking about some fine tuning. Um, I have a lot of them, and so I'm just gonna like lay them out, and then um, I don't know if I could maybe just shoot an email to a or okay. Um, I feel like there's missing considerations for gender diverse students um, for the restrooms, so that would be single stall um, restrooms that are not for teachers. Um, so the, the modern standard to um, address this is instead of having one room with many stalls that's like for quote unquote the girls or quote the boys, you have lots of doors along the hall for single occupancy rooms for whatever student wants to go into them. Um, next, I um, have some comments about like the sales pitch overall. And because of my experience with the board, I'm just not familiar with who takes this awesome document and then adds to it. So I think it's it doesn't have yet, and the details really aren't there yet for it to have this type of information yet, but I think we need to get there before it goes to a town meeting. And that is basically the lifetime operational costs. You know, like what is it costing to operate Pembroke Hill schools right now? What are those big items? And what would be the estimated operating costs of the new Hill School? Because when you analyze the lifetime the anticipated, you know, it's probably going to be a 20 to 40 year lifetime, that operational cost often is much more expensive even than the upfront construction cost. And it's like a hidden cost that people don't realize that it's actually adds up to more than the construction cost. So to me, I always think that's a more important number. Um, and then related to that, what is the opportunity for efficiencies in there to save on contributing to carbon emissions? You know, what are the efficiency features with the water, the air, the energy, all that? Um, different thought. Was it considered to just like level either of the 62 or the 64 portions? and convert those to the big spaces. I did catch when you said it was considered to take down the walls of those sections and then build new walls to make, you know, bigger classrooms and that that just didn't make sense. But I didn't know if it made sense to like, you know, just completely eliminate like all the interior walls and if you guys considered that or not. Um, I love, like, really one of my favorite parts are these big um, exterior courtyards in the interior of the plan. Um, I think those are fantastic. I think they will lend themselves well to, you know, very close proximity to the indoors, outdoor educational experiences. Um, but I feel like they may be underutilized if they're not well planned and well equipped. And with respect to the commentary that, you know, the classrooms need to have standardized amenities or features, for lack of a better word, I think that those courtyards also need to be thought of in that way so that they can be really well utilized. And then let's see here. I was really happy to see the um, past demographic trends at the end of the report, but I'm interested in having information about demographic projections into the future. Um, I would very much like to see a dedicated lactation room. I'd like to know the answer that I anticipate I will get when this hits the town meeting, which is, all right, I mean, if I consider voting for that, like when and how long will this last? You know, like when when will we need to do this again? Um, and then I'm not clear on the timeline. So, are we? Is the goal that this would hit town meeting next year in 2022, 2023, 
Yeah, so I, I just think it would be helpful to have sort of a timeline in mind um, for when we had time meeting. And I'm glad to hear that yes, it's not 2022. So I don't think we're. So just I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, so just to clarify, I think the next step for this board is to decide whether or not you want to move forward. So you have the recommendations. I think we all know that a long recommendation would be that, that there needs to be some type of construction. Um, I, my recommendation would be that you decide whether or not you're going to put up a new RFP. I'm not sure that I'm going to my RFP and it has to work, but we have been coming for a very specific purpose. And if the sports decides to go forward and start looking for um, more detailed work, um, we need to put up an RFP for other firms where Allenstown just went through the process to get into the middle of it and we want some really experienced um, firms that have built schools in the area. So they're definitely out there and they will take us through the entire process. Um, you know, they'll start with sort of getting that firm on board. They'll have architects working for them, engineers. Um, they do all of the um, advertising, the PR, they help facilitate the community. It's incredibly comprehensive what these firms are, are able to do for us. So I think this is we're at like super, super infant uh, infancy here in determining what's gonna happen next. So it would be, I would anticipate maybe the following year, um, we might be ready to get into the bond. And hopefully, fingers crossed, the next planning budget may have a in it because um, that's a huge document in the process. Can I just take a quick moment and uh, kind of go through some of those? The Dennis Myers report does have population projection information in it. Uh, I believe it's on page 33. And with the information that they had a few years ago, this was intended to uh, meet our needs through 2040. And it's 2021 now. And we're even probably paying off the bond by then if you get their recommendation. So, like when we say, you know, an extra classroom here or an extra classroom there, it's not really family, it's really they can show that if you don't pay off a bond to turn around and need to float another bond. The other reality is we have two other school buildings that may need bonded items um, to address needs uh, on a large scale that might not have been probably planned for the CIP. Although I will tell you on the CIP committee, not speaking for that, but there, there's a pretty comprehensive plan in place for the other buildings. The items are held and deliberately left off that with the with the plan of addressing them in part of a large scale project. Um, and a clarification question. So a lot of your things that you came up with. Um, you had the um, the gender neutral restrooms. Uh, wasn't even a recommendation because nobody else brought it up. So I, I agree with you that that is a reality and an important reality that should be considered uh, when you as a board moves forward, that is something that should perhaps be communicated to them as well. And um, would that be in addition to the large scale bathrooms or in which they spun out, I guess it would be So that you would have sort of a choice of where to go. There's a lot of cost of demolition. Not being a demolition contractor, like it just we couldn't justify bringing a proposal that is so large and yeah. unnecessarily demolishing sections of a building and reconstructing them. Also, um, that that is why, like it was talked about, somebody did throw that out, like we could just tear that down. Yeah. But there are many of us that probably wish that. But from a financial standpoint, just probably couldn't be justified when they're already talking about um, a very large project and a very expensive project to add on those, those costs. Um, so that's why we didn't recommend any of that as much. If you took the 1962 way out of there, that gives a lot of breathing room for um, that section of the building to be very close to the property line and the 
like a drop off loop there from Berkeley to Rowe. Like it, it would be nice to have a little more space there, but he would have to make up that square footage somewhere else, and that's all at a cost. And I just I don't think it I don't think it can be absorbed. So that that's why that's not there. Um, nobody mentioned lactation when I'm surprised because that that is very important. That is going to non-public for child and remove all the time. So um, I agree with that again. I think anybody on our committee would have a problem with it. It just wasn't brought up as something that should be should be in the building. Um, how long is this carry us? Oh, court hearings. I, I agree with you. We didn't talk about it in our report, but if we did that, um, I'm thinking of the host of town hall building right now on Main Street. That used to be an elementary school. Uh, that was a courtyard in the middle. And I worked at the town hall when we moved there from the old town hall. And that courtyard was actually adopted during its school years by the Parent Teacher Association. And it had a paper walkway and tables out there and Jam Evergreen, which used to be where the ice cream is on 38 and donated. There was all kinds of landscape plan out there. And it looks like they did use that for an extension of academic space. And, and it could be great if you if you did it there with what's with the plan in place. Um, it was mostly grass free out there so that Josh doesn't have to drive the lawnmowers to the hallways to, to take care of it. But you know, it was I know we used it for lunch years when we moved there to town hall employees, but it looks like it was a very nice space too from a learning perspective. So you're absolutely right. And, and I did notice not when I got there too, but we did not cover it in our report. So that's all. Yeah. Well, you got some questions. So just to um, focus this a little bit. Obviously, this is like that. It's been a very long term thing. And I think tonight, especially because we have a missing member, uh, we can you know, look for the procedure to start going through all the time. Um, and there's also 36 pages of information, which I guess. So I think for now, um, as we could probably do this all night, I think we'll probably do more questions of the committee. Um, you know, process wise, you can go to blast. Is there more you wish you have done? If you do not have access to something that you wish you did, um, you know, as far as specifics of what the plan is, that will all come out with architects and, and people that we pay to do that. Um, so, not trying to stop anybody from asking anything, just kind of want to keep this a little bit focused. Thank you. Thank you. I was not on the board at the time that Dean Smiley was presented to the Merck School Board, and I was in attendance at that school board meeting. And one of the things that really stuck out to me from that meeting, which may help you, is the time frame for a school board meeting, a first school building, is 50 years. So when I saw this report, I had the same thoughts as you. I'm really concerned about, you know, keeping buildings that are 52 and 59 years old. Uh, I think some of the concern was during this construction, probably around the students. Uh, but I do agree that they would be great as our superintendent recommended to probably have an RFP so we can compare what the options are. Uh, I did have a question. First off, I want to say thank you to the many. I remember this has been a long time in the works. Uh, and two of the questions uh, are if you could just um, clarify to us. Um, what the mission of the committee was, and then the other question we have is, I love this color report. Thank you so much for bringing us printed copies. It looks lovely. Um, the one thing I didn't see is um, each individual's role that is on the committee. Obviously, it's important to include, you know, community members across the community. It'd be nice to know um, who is actually a staff member or perhaps an immediate member of a staff um, in this and how they might be associated with the school. Thank you. I can address that now. That's okay. So without getting into it, we are very collaborative. They weren't really. Um, this group asked me to chair it at the beginning and I did. I don't think we had a vice chair. Um, but we have a really good mix of 
community members. You know, Sandy here is a staff member and a resident. Um, I'm a resident a parent and the spouse of a staff member. Um, Jen, at the time, wasn't a staff member, but is now, um, but is also a parent and resident. Um, Rob here was a uh, resident, but he's had kids that have gone through the school system. Um, while he doesn't currently have children enrolled, is still interested in, you know, seeing our school district and community prosper. Uh, we have Kristen Doyle, who uh, is a social studies teacher here at Emory Academy, a parent of high school students. Uh, who am I forget? Stephanie Ferreira was with us. Um, she dropped off, I believe, in the fall. She took on some new responsibilities for pals that uh, just created some scheduling conflicts. So she she couldn't see us to the end. But she's a parent of school children here and uh, a resident of the town. We had uh, Phil Bobear kind of came in in the middle. He is a parent of children in that middle. He is a resident. He came through the school system here. And he also works in construction and at the time was working on a school construction project in a believe new market. Um, so we, we had a lot of I am Rob brings the fire. I just forget because I didn't voice that fire. But, but yeah, Rob being deputy fire chief, am I getting the title right? Um, you know, brings a lot of the life safety and, and inspection perspective to, to the project as well. So This is really a question to the board. Um, is there a need to formally uh, receive or accept a report from the subcommittee? Um, do we have additional duties that we would like to charge them with at this point? Um, these people have really worked really long and hard for us. And not only them, but I also want to thank our staff who work in collaboration with this team. So, what kind of do you need action on this tonight to formally accept? The uh, recommendation of the appeal school relation. So, I don't, I don't know the story if they don't have that involved, but it's actually very interesting. Um, I definitely echo the sentiment. Um, we will thank you all the administration for making yourselves available to do that in this purpose and allowing the speaker to have a staff meeting and everything like that. Um, you know, whatever firm is a little bit to say, that's kind of recommended. It'll be important that we have staff administrators in the teams on those teams because those are the ones that are there that have to be there every day. So we want to take away some of those opinions if we can. Um, any other questions for these guys tonight? Sure. <laughs> While we have committee members here, I would just uh, ask that if you're at all interested, your participation in the future would be invaluable. Um, and when we had to review the RFPs from firms, there were, you know, all of your specialty areas were so helpful to review those and to see what people brought to the table and their intimate knowledge of everything. Um, I'm sure you'd be very welcome to stick around if you're interested. So thank you so much for your work. Can I just throw one more thing out there? Bring it up. It's not renovation recommended, but it came up during our process when we met with the Hill School staff, which was, I think, in early January. Um, one of the items that kind of kept coming up was it felt like they were not getting their needs met by the facility staff. And I know that that's probably not the reality, it's just a perception. And I think a great way that you could address this is to look into an electronic ticketing system for facilities. And you have reporting for that, right? The last I saw was like a clipboard or a folder full of all these paper things. And when things go unaddressed, I, I am sure that there's probably a reason why somebody's request didn't happen. They just aren't always aware of it. So having an electronic ticket system, they would know the status of their ticket. You could adopt formal operating procedures on like high, medium, low priorities. Uh, 
the time frames or the expectations for those. Um, requesters could see any, uh, any changes or, you know, some sort of complaints on the work list. Basically, any modifications to the status of their ticket. Um, that could also be part of a report and it's going to be meeting between facilities director and the building leadership. The leadership can see at any point what their staff need and are requesting about our facilities department. And if you're doing a regular meeting, which may already be happening, but you don't have that, that technology piece in place, they don't have the visual of what their staff are requesting to discuss why or why not things have been addressed to a staff member's expectation. And like I said, I know Josh's job in the past and I've been in a similar capacity. There's always a reason why you do or don't do something. It's just making sure those people are out. But then you also have a school board member that gets um, assigned to building stuff. So that report could also be furnished to them as part of their community packet and their board report. They could press and question things with the facility director independently of the meeting setting, but it just gives a little transparency and understanding. Because I, I mean, I know Josh well enough to know that he, he and his team are ignoring the needs. There, there's a reason, but that it's just the communication piece is is not ideal in our kind of deeper environment that we have right now. So suggestion. Thanks for that. I, as an IT person, I hate to be system, but they're necessary evil. Well, it's definitely something to support. Uh, but also what you said earlier, I think it's important too. That crew updated the building. It's a lot easier to maintain constantly chasing the tail on something that's, that's that old and has constant problems to move. But again, thank you all. I'm sure this is good to have a conversation for some time um, to have a conversation uh, about moving forward sometime soon. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you I'm just looking at our schedule of meetings. Um, it's May 4th today. We have May 18th and June 1st on the books before we're done meeting for this year. And I'd like to really strongly encourage the board, if we're going to put anything out for an RFP, that we get that approved and out the door before we close the books on this year by June 1st. Um, yeah, so I would encourage everybody to go over this on your own before our next meeting. Uh, and, uh, thank you for putting that to the agenda. Um, and hopefully you can set some time for that class so we can take some sort of action. Thank you. So it's a little uncomfortable hearing that um, as a board member that staff feel like the needs are not being met. So I'd like to ask our superintendent, I'm sure that she's not comfortable hearing that either probably. And just speak to that as about the current curriculum and what you would encourage people uh, to do if they're feeling that way. So that they know the proper channels if they don't already know to write you know those issues to come forward. Thank you. Patty, go ahead. Just ask if you can brief. I think that's a little bit outside of the agenda item, so we can put that on the agenda if you need to. But yeah, I mean, I will leave this in Josh's hands. Um, he. Uh, he has brought to me several times a digital option, and we have not put it in the budget because it was very costly. Um, so that's something that he's always looking toward. And I've never heard a complaint, so I'm kind of surprised to hear that. Um, I know there were some issues with the aging of the building and just things that, just, like you said, you couldn't, couldn't do. And there were reasons for that. So I think that's definitely a personal issue that I don't want Josh to go. We'll talk about that. And it's not a Okay, um, so that brings us to 7B, just the year 21. Thank you very much. So today you are at $1,030,000. Um, as you know, we did approve some projects at the last meeting that have not been uh, put through the system yet. And I would anticipate more money coming soon. Uh, I don't um, so we're at the point where we're starting to close things down, and we have, you know, like Amber said, when you look at a line, and it's 50,000 here, 50,000 there, all of a sudden that adds up to quite a chunk. 
um, specifically things like the course money and workshops. You know, here's not done, but we're going to get to the point where we need to kind of figure out like, what's left and close those lines so that we know how much farther the funds are being released. So there will be more than that, but that's where we're at today. Any questions, comments on that? Um, I, I guess not to give direction unilaterally, but <laughs> yeah, but I would. So rough math, if we take out the almost 200 that we talked about last time, we're still at $850,000 or something, and there's a possibility of more coming. Um, maybe the good or bad with some expectations, both at NBC and with the meeting this past weekend, around $700,000 um, as a rough figure. I'm certainly not saying we have to spend down to that, but as Amy pointed out, we don't have any meetings left either. So I think Josh, I would encourage you to um, maybe make us another list for next meeting, and we may not do anything. Um, but if we feel like we're in a position to spend some of that money, I'd like to have the ability to do it with a, with a list in front of us so that we have to turn it off since we don't have to meetings left. I can do that. Um, you know, I, I think I would say prioritize safety type stuff first, um, and kind of let us know what we think is, is priority. But um, if having, having the list in front of us in case we can take some action. And again, not to prolong this, but just to let you know, um, the approach that Deerfield took was they, they did a warrant article and put in, I think, $175,000 to engage um, a firm. So it has come with a costly um, <laughs> price tag. You're not going to be able to do that this year because you won't be able to get the RFP out and get the responses and get through that. So you may want to consider looking at some things that you plan to do next year to do now to free up that money um, to use for a fund for next year. So it's just a thought. I'm not sure um, what you meant, Patty, when you said that the electronic ticketing system, Josh, is going to costly. But if it is in the range of the numbers we have available to us, I think it would be worthwhile to throw on that list for us to consider and then it's moving on. Anything else around the third budget? All right, we will move on to more reports. I don't think we have any this evening. Jay um, is not here. Was there an example of you? Yep. Um, ARA, no. Budget three. So, I guess now that we have had our meeting, uh, as everybody knows, it's been everything in the past. Um, I think I mentioned before, Mr. LePage did schedule a retrospective for the season, and uh, that is coming up once it's 17 it's in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so I don't know how that goes. I'm glad he's doing that because it's a good, good way to look back. Um, and I guess I did receive an email that one budget committee member is not planning to return next year. So for the people in the community, um, Looking to volunteer, which are going to turn all that's an appointed position by the moderator, I believe. Um, so there's a list. Um, if you want to be on that list, contact on all. Any case? The next meeting date is May 17th. That's a Monday at 6 p.m. Monday at 6 Monday is, sorry, what was the date? 17th. Monday is 17th at 6 p.m. Well, that other meeting is definitely not the 17th. That comes up Thursday. Good day. The budget for you, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, re I'm pretty sure I'm reading that correctly. May 17th. All right. Um, we are at principles. So, I think it's a little bit of a problem. Okay. I'll be uh, brief. Um, we are actually, May is kind of a funny month, typically, because we are right in the middle of June. Your preparations, particularly around graduation, um, finalizing my final schedule, and uh, trying to get students across the finish line. But with that, we're also really starting to move up preparations for next year. Uh, and, you know, part of that is the hiring process, and we continue that with the best vacancies moving forward. Um, and then another added component to all of this is that we have winter carnival in May. Uh, so that's actually what, you know, Ryan is a busy guy. I'm uh, going to tell you that he is 
are the students on uh, staff that are charged with um, you know, putting on pretty unprecedented during the carnival that I think has been held at a time of guard, particularly among our seniors and they're anticipating uh, having this experience together as a group. And I would be more confident of uh, the students and staff that are going to that approach. So I'm excited about that. The only other thing I'll say is that, you know, we are continuing to, um, you know, navigate uh, COVID and in addition to that, work on what kind of interventions we can put in place. And when looking at that, we're always trying to look for things that are not single serving or single kind of purpose interventions or things that we can also use to support our programming uh, now in the future. So for instance, you know, when we're looking at the cafeteria, we also got uh, some collapsible tables. We wanted to make sure that those tables were eight feet long so that we could use those for SAT testing uh, in the future, uh, rather than six foot one, which is probably for some reason. So, uh, you know, second thing, the, uh, the public comment microphone is being run off of an amplifier that is also battery powered, so the teachers can take those outside for you know external uh, outdoor classrooms, and then after that, it can also be used for our music program. So it's just those sorts of things that we're trying to be creative with, so that it's not basically. I don't want to be tripping on prices less than three years. I want things that are going to be uh, able to support our program. What do we do, everybody, tonight? There will be questions. We're we'll not stopping the So, uh, John, yes. Well, let's see. I thank you. Uh, I do need to thank the pals because pals have been in the building this week. Uh, I believe the pals were lost. I'm sure it's everything else. Um, but every day they would be giving something to our staff, uh, whether it's food or a tree, something that I need I don't think we can understate uh, the importance of that for staff and the feeling that those people to be able to run down to the teacher's room and decorate and trick it all out. It's just um, maybe more so this year than other years. It just, it just really shows uh, the people that are in town that do support us. Uh, sometimes they're not mobile, but sometimes they are there. Uh, you know, so it's very much appreciated. I did meet with the new uh, Palace of Persons uh, chairman this morning. Um, we talked about some of the end of the year. I think they've always been supportive with field trips, um, things of that nature. I did, those of you who are new, I did throw out the playground again. <laughs> I'm going to get that stuff there. Um, but just about fundraising, because we really have nothing to hide on our campus for kids to do it for. Um, so we do have uh, some money to work with Josh to start clearing the area. Um, so we can start the parents where they're allowed to sit in this area or something. Uh, I, I feel like we need to do that. But I don't know if we're able to work something for Palace and Rock, but they've always been super supportive uh, of all the things we're doing. Uh, we are going to be testing next week. Uh, and we will we'll be having a modified schedule in the building. Uh, Alice wants to get us and provide the kids a snack, so we can get a snack every time we test. Uh, so that's very much appreciated. Uh, we do have to shut down the whole building in the test, and we have to shut down every Chromebook because it is a secure site. So no Chromebooks will work except for that test. So um, that's quite a chore to go through when you shut down and all the Chromebooks. Because you this one, so it's over 200 Chromebooks. Um, so we'll be working on that. Um, Amy Ontario has reached out, and she was our coordinator for environmental camp. She had reached out. We have not had a opportunity. She did reach out to their group. They are willing to come to our school and do a, a day for the seventh grade outside of our building and a day for our sixth grade. Uh, well, it doesn't compare maybe to the three or four days of our night experience. We will be able to have something uh, in place uh, on campus. And the price, can, honestly, is more than reasonable uh, for two days uh, to have a team of people. They'll send their teachers to us and they'll do an activities out of our backyard. Which we decided to do. Um, we are preparing for a promotion, which will be outside. 
uh, we've got some details that we need to work on. Uh, we typically have a similar total after, and we will not do that this year. Uh, it would have to be outside, and I just. <laughs> Without going into a lot of detail. So, we are working on that. We're also working on uh, every year, the uh, department puts on a boy day field day experience. Uh, we did not have that last year in the preparation for that. This year, trying to start out to do six feet spacing and all that stuff. But we're going to continue to do that. This year, we'll try to roll that out um, as we go. So, I'll keep you posted on some of those things. Um, a lot of the same things going on at Hill as we're winding down. Um, we're looking at injecting some. Okay. Um, we're going to uh, have some spirit days every Friday in the last five weeks of school. Can't wait to see the kiddos get dressed up on staff too. That they are very lively. That is one thing I have learned. There are so many hats in the building, <laughs> and that is the yeah, that you laugh because it's totally true. Um, I I love it because I get to see everyone's personalities, the kids, and the faculty. So that's one of my favorite things. Um, we are we have outdoor classrooms that um, are being worked on right now, and we're looking at doing an outdoor classroom day on May twentieth. The idea is out there with kind of one thing at that, so we're excited um, to kind of get everybody outdoors doing some of those things since we're not doing field trips and things like that. Um, one of the things we're spending quite a bit of time on is talking about next year. I know it seems premature to talk about it, but we really need to, and it's really, really important. A lot of our focus is on we want to hit the ground running. We know that this year there were challenges, there are, you know, I don't like the word gaps, but those are the things we think about. So we're really working to put those plans in place, um, developing our intervention systems um, and things like that so that next year we have that ability to really look at our data, determine what the need is, and go from there. Because if you think about what we talked about earlier with our kindergartners who chose not to come in this year, they're going into first grade. That presents a huge challenge. So you do wind up with a classroom that in your brain is multi, like it's a multi grade class. It's kindergarten coming in. So we're preparing for those and we'll be thinking about how we can do that. We're going to be up our intervention systems, um, look, taking a look at our assessment practices, how we analyze data and things like that. So we're starting those conversations. I really want the staff to know that we have that in mind. So when we come back, we know where we're going to go. Um, so that's a big uh, thing that we're looking at right now. Um, we met as a team for our summer program to kind of take a look at that. There's going to be a survey going out. I'm still collecting to see you know, who's interested in working. I think uh, when we boil down to it, we're going to have a focus on social emotional learning um, because of when staff was available to actually be there um, to support the program. But they are being very creative and I'm super excited about it. Um, like John said, teacher appreciation. It, was very much needed this year, this week, and having those treats and things like that. There were smiles. There was a smoothie bus there mm -hmm. yesterday. That was a it, yeah. Oh, it was a big hit. They really liked it. Um, so we were very, very thankful for that. Um, it was really good today. Uh, <laughs> another thing coming our way, very similar is staff testing for us. It's May 17th through 19th. Um, similar, all the same things that we have to go through in preparation for that. So Winding down, but still keeping next year in mind on the challenges for this year that we're going to be prepared for next year. Um, questions? Comments? John, can you play the rest? Yeah. Is it fun? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Today she asked for Aaron, of course. To get asked for one today. Yeah. <laughs> wow. No idea. No, I typed the part. We have to go through sure. Yeah, that was thrilled. <laughs> um, so I am a big planner. I do not think it's pretty sure I'm thinking about next year at this time. Um, but I do think it might be pretty sure even at the board's last meeting on um, June 1st to decide what the mask policy is going to be for next academic year. And so I was just looking at our calendar for the next board meeting. So 
Are we planning on Tuesday, August 3rd board meeting on deciding what our mask policy is? I mean, tentatively, is that the plan to decide what our mask policy for the next academic year is going to be at that time? That's a great question. We actually just talked about that as, a, as an administrative team today because the state is going to be asking once again for um, re entry plans. And we, we weren't really expecting that because we thought, well, we're back. So, um, but they did want to know what were, what accommodations, modifications we're going to have in place when we come back. So, um, we do have the ability to revise that plan. So, at this point, I think we just need your mass policy as it stands. Um, and then I think any meeting that you have, it's for through visiting and um, certainly by August 3rd of the latest, if you were going to change it and relax it, um, then I would say we should make that decision August 3rd of the latest. Any other questions from the festivals? So my motion was going to be to withdraw all the first readings um, CFA A all the way down to GCMD J. Anyway, so I'll second that. Um, so, motion to withdraw the following policies. And before I start, they're all recommended for withdrawal uh, CFA A, Public Schools Principal Job Description, CFA B, Job Description. Probably not. Uh, yeah, yeah. in order. So, all the ones under the first. From CFA to the bottom. Yep. CFA A. Yeah. So CFA B, job description of headmaster of Pembroke Academy. CFA B, job description of director of the director of the instruction of PA. GCCAE, professional staff visitations and conferences. GCMB A, CRS, coach, great to both way, co curricular job description. GCMB B, CRS, council advisor, co curricular job description. GCMD status C, TRS yearbook advisor, co curricular job description. GCMD B, TRS athletic co curricular job description. GCMD E, PA National Water Society co curricular job description. GCMD F, PA Audio Services co curricular job description. GCMD G, PA Nursery Sports co curricular job description. GCMD H, PA Arts Services Co curricular job description, GCMB I, TRS 8th grade trip advisor, and GCMB J, TRS 6th grade trip advisor. And there's a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Fantastic. Anything else on policy? Right? We'll move on to ten minutes. So I'm here to haunt you with a calendar. Um, <laughs> I'm desperately trying to schedule meetings for you, and I know now we're missing two people. Um, it's very difficult to find a date when everyone can make it. So I need to know availability for June, July, and August. And I have um, X out in red a few of the dates we know that are unavailable because of the meetings and graduation. So I'm going to pass that around for board members. Um, so we need to schedule a meeting for um, school board association to come and do the training. And then we also need to schedule a meeting to do your goals. Um, it would be great if we can. If we can't schedule two, then at a minimum, I would say we need to work on your goals on August 3rd. Um, hoping that this summer does not prove to be as busy as last summer did, but if you could just fill that in for me, that will help us facilitate schedule. Um, I quit puns. <laughs> it's good <laughs> and this, this is an evening only. Evening, weekday only. We're only meeting on weekdays, evenings. Right. That is the plan at this point, unless. The board wants to do otherwise. 
can find us at in the summer. We're all available. We can hang out both in the state and Barrett's available. I'm all for it, but he's uh, to be determined, it used to be on Wednesdays, but selectmen moved to Wednesdays, so we're going to have to move something else. Okay, um, so we can fill that out online. So that brings us to our second public comment section. That's where we wish to speak. Sure. <laughs> I've spoken on it. <laughs> yes, a little bit of water. Okay. We'll move on. We've already done our public. We've already done the public presentation of the parents. Our next scheduled meeting is May 18th at 630. Same location. Any other business before we do something with the adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All in favor. Thanks, everybody.